What a great place to be in life where you're overcome by the Holy Spirit's presence. I don't know why. Well, maybe I do. I don't know. The last couple of weeks, I've been watching a lot more of the Olympics than I thought I would have been watching. And uh, maybe you've been following it as well. I think maybe part of what it's been for me is noticing the age range of the different athletes. For instance, on one end, you have this lady, Mary Hannah, who is 66 years old, okay? Uh, she's from Australia, and she's competing in her seventh Olympics, okay? She's an equestrian, equestrian uh, whatever that word is, uh, athlete. She's a grandmother, okay? And uh, she's the second oldest Olympian to ever have competed in the Olympic Games. Now, her team didn't do as well as she would have wanted them to. And so she's already said she's looking forward to Paris in 2024 when she'll be competing when she's 70 years old. My comment is, go girl, okay? And hope the horse is nice. That's all I got to say. On the other end of the spectrum, there's a 12-year-old, or there was a 12-year-old table tennis player named Hin Zaza from Syria. He didn't do very well. But then there's this 13-year-old from Japan, Momichi Nishia, who won the first ever gold medal awarded at the Olympics <clears throat> for women's street skateboarding. Pretty impressive. Also, she is the youngest who'd ever received a medal from Japan. Okay, so a couple of big honors there for Momichi. From America, there's 15-year-old Katie Grimes, who did not win a medal at this Olympics. But if you've heard anything about Katie, you know that she's being dubbed as the next Katie Ledecky. And Katie Ledecky is like the gold standard when it comes to U.S. women's swimming. And so uh, I also hope she thinks, I ho also hope that uh, Katie Grimes has Katie Ledecky's personality. Because if you've seen any interviews or read anything uh, from Ledecky, she has just got to be one of the world's nicest people. And uh, I hope her a lot of success as well. So there you have quite an age range, okay? 12 to 66. And in some sports, especially track and field, especially the track portions of it, when you get in your 20s, you're old, okay? And you really have to work to be able to do well. But then there's this Sydney McLaughlin, okay? I don't know if you saw this race or not. When she ran the 400-meter uh, hurdles race, it had to be probably one of the most amazing races that I've ever seen. They make it look so easy, don't they, when they run the hurdles? Anybody ever tried to run hurdles before? I remember in high school <laughs> trying to do that and almost doing a nosedive onto the track because those things are high. And uh, you got to just time everything, and it's amazing what they can do. But what you may not know about Sydney is she's a very, really, really strong uh, believer in Christ. In fact, on Instagram, after the Olympic trials in Oregon, this is what she posted. It's kind of a long quote, but it's just, it's just amazing. She says, my faith was really tested all week from bad practices to three false start delays to a meat delay. I just kept hearing God say, just focus on me. That was the best race plan I could have ever assembled, she says. I no longer run for self-recognition, but to reflect his perfect will that is already set in stone. I don't deserve anything. But by grace, through faith, Jesus has given me everything. Records come and go. The glory of God is eternal. Thank you, Father. I love that girl. Okay, that is just amazing. I wish her the very best in the future. Then if you've watched any men swimming, you've probably seen this guy, Caleb Dreschel. He's an old man. He's 24 years old, okay? But what you may not know is how strong his faith is. And if you notice that tattoo coming up his uh, sleeve on his arm there, it's a tattoo of an eagle that he says was inspired by Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Caleb won five gold medals at this Olympics, and I'm praying that he will win many, many more because he's very outspoken about his faith. You know, when I see and hear about these young athletes who have such a strong, such a strong faith, it, it gives me hope because there seems to be so many other messages that are out there today. And so I hope that we will pray for these, these young men and women. 
and that God will continue to allow them to have success and that they will continue to be a witness for him, especially uh, for younger people. Well, today, we're going to keep running our own marathon, and that's the marathon through the Old Testament book of Job. And uh, this week, we're going to be introduced to a guy named Elihu, who was young. At least that's what he says. He was younger than the other three friends of Job that we've been reading about these last few weeks. Now, the question has been, how young was Elihu? We don't know. We will never know. But what we do know is that he makes a pretty strong point that says even though he's young, he's wise. And he has some insights into what was going on in Job's life that I think merit us looking at this morning. What we're going to see uh, from this message, and if you saw the title of the message, I do think he was on to some things. He wasn't right on on everything, but he was tracking in the right direction with some of what was going on in Job's life. I think he was... I think the fact that Job didn't get to rebut him like he did the other three friends is significant, okay? And I'll share something else later about why I think that may have happened as well. When I read Elihu's six chapters, okay, he has six chapters in the book of Job, um, I see it kind of as a prelude to what we're going to look at next week, which was God's conversation with Job, because some of the main themes that are in Elihu's speech are the same things that God shares with Job as well. And again, God didn't give Job time to rebut anything that Elihu said. So I think we've got to take note of that. So let's jump in, okay? Chapter 32 is where we're going to start today because that's where we're introduced to Elihu. And there were three things that I want to share with you today that I think he was on the right track in his thinking. And the first one was this. Be respectful even when you're angry. We need to be respectful even when we're angry. We don't know how long Elihu was listening to the conversation between Job and Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar. But he's not mentioned until chapter 32. And when he jumps in, we gather that he's heard quite a bit of the conversation, but he wasn't mentioned. Here's how we're introduced to him in chapter 32, verse 2. Then Elihu, son of Barakal, the Buzite of the clan of Ram, became angry. He was angry because Job refused to admit that he had sinned and that God was right in punishing him. He was also angry with Job's three friends, for they made God appear to be wrong by their inability to answer Job's arguments. Elihu had waited for the others to speak to Job because they were older than he. But when he saw that they had no further reply, he spoke out how? Angrily. So here we are, we're introduced to young Elihu, and what do we learn about him? He's an angry young man. <laughs> and what's he angry about? He's got this righteous indignation. He's got this righteous anger because he's convinced that Job is wrong, that he had done something to cause God to allow and or to do what had happened to him. But right beside that, he was just as mad because of what? The three friends couldn't change Job's mind. He was upset because Job kept saying, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. And Elihu says, no, you're not, no, you're not. And the three friends kept saying, no, you're not, but they couldn't change his mind. So what happened was Elihu was just very, very angry. Listen to what he says, okay? Even though he's angry, he is respectful. Chapter 32, verse 6, he says, I am young, you are old. Now, just listen to how he's, he says these things. I, I just, for some reason, they just jumped off the pages of Scripture this time. He says, I am young, you are old, so I held back from telling you what I think. I thought those who are older should speak, for wisdom comes with age. But there is a spirit within people, the breath of the Almighty within them, that makes them intelligent. Sometimes, he says, the elders are not wise. Sometimes the aged do not understand justice. It's kind of a slap in the back, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of a, a little knife in the, in the back. And he says, so listen to me. I'm going to tell you what I think. 
I've waited all this time, listening very carefully to your arguments, listening to you grope for words. I've listened, but not one of you have, have refuted Job or answered his arguments. And don't tell me this, he says, that he's too wise for us, that only God can convince him. If Job had been arguing with me, I would not answer with your kind of logic. You sit there baffled with nothing more to say. Should I continue to wait now that you are silent? Must I also remain silent? No! I will say my piece and I will speak my mind. Verse 18. For I am full of pent up words. And the spirit within me urges me on. I'm like a cask of wine without a vent, like a new wineskin ready to burst. I must speak to find relief, so let me give my answers. I won't play favorites or try to flatter anyone, for if I try flattery, my creator will soon destroy me. Man, them are some strong words from a young man, are they not? He kind of reminds me of Ralphie in the Christmas story. Remember Ralphie in the Christmas story? He's always getting picked on by Scott, um, uh, what's his last name? Farkas. Okay, actually it's Scott Farkas, but they call him Scott. Scott Farkas is always picking on him on his way home from school and beating him up and taking his money and taking his lunch and all that kind of stuff. And what happens? One day, Ralphie is just so upset that what happens? He goes off on the guy. Now, they have to beep out some of his language. We don't have to do that with Elihu. But in my mind, it's kind of, that's what Elihu was like. He's been building up all this anger and all this frustration for so long. And then finally he says, hey, I can't be quiet anymore. Listen to me. He really believed that God would not have allowed any of this to happen if Job didn't deserve it. And what we're going to find out is that he was on to something but he didn't know the whole story. Just like the other three friends, he didn't know chapter one. He didn't know. He should have read that before he started talking, but he didn't. He didn't know that indeed Job was righteous. He did demonstrate one thing, though, and that was that he was respectful to his elders. I see us living in a day and time where rude and loud is the norm. And there doesn't seem to be much respect given to those who are old or those who are young. In fact, I think the divisions in our country now is allowing things to be said about people that we wouldn't have dreamt would have been said just a few years ago. I think it's important that we remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 13. Remember that passage where he's talking about give people what they're due, whether that be money? And he says, if someone deserves honor, then we give them honor. To those of you who might be listening to this message later who are younger, let me just encourage you to be like Elihu and show honor to those who are older we all know that in most cultures, the older people who've had life experiences are lifted up and they're honored. Nowadays, depending on who you talk to, older people are sometimes at best tolerated and not respected. I really do think Aretha Franklin had something right when she said it's about R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And I think respect needs to be given, even when we're angry. The second thing that Elihu was on to, and again, this is where we begin seeing the, la the overlap between Job and God and Elihu. And that was that God isn't defined by man. God isn't defined by man. Last week we talked about Job's great view of God and it seems as though he and Elihu at least had this in common that they had this elevated view of God meaning that God was bigger than, the, than mankind and God was going to do some things that we're not going to understand. Let me add to the words that we talked about last week from Job these verses from Elihu and there's quite a few of them. We'll turn to chapter 33 where he begins by just flat out addressing Job's claims that he was blameless and innocent. He says, but you, Job, are wrong. 
And I will show you why. For God is greater than any human being. So why are you bringing a charge against him? Why say he does not respond to people's complaints? For God speaks again and again, though people do not recognize it. If you read on in chapter 33, he talks about how he uses dreams and visions and even whispers in people's ears. And then if you turn with me to chapter 36, he becomes the local weatherman, Elihu does, when he starts using meteorological terms <laughs> to talk about God's power. I think it's pretty impressive. Again, just think this is on the 6 o'clock news, okay, on channel 20 or channel 17. He's explaining a lot of weather terms here. Verse 26, he says, look, God is greater than we can understand. His years cannot be counted. And then he goes into these things. He draws up the water vapor and then distills it into rain. The rain pours down from the clouds and everyone benefits. Who can understand the, sp the spreading of the clouds and the thunder and the rolls that rolls from the heaven? See how he spreads the lightning around him and how it lights up the depths of the sea? By these mighty acts, he nourishes the people, giving them food in abundance. He fills his hands with lightning bolts and hurls each at its targets. The thunder announces his presence. The storm announces his indignant anger. Next time we have a thunderstorm, remember, look at Job chapter 36. Job chapter 37 verse 1 says, My heart pounds as I think of this. It trembles within me. Listen carefully to the thunder of God's voice as it rolls from his mouth. It rolls across the heavens and its lightning flashes in every direction. Then comes the roaring of the thunder, the tremendous voice of his majesty. He does not restrain it when he speaks. God's voice is glorious in the thunder. We can't even imagine the greatness of his power. Elihu wanted to make sure that Job knew who he was dealing with. And the good news is Job knew who he was dealing with. We saw that last week. Do we ever struggle with trying to understand who God is? Because sometimes we see him as this sovereign, all-powerful God. And we'll ascribe to him all of the power of creator and all of the things that he can do. And we're just in awe and respect of him. But then aren't there times when we just want him to be our daddy in heaven who gives us a big hug when we need it? It's difficult sometimes to balance those two. We want him to be all powerful, but then we want him to be gracious and loving. Both are true. The danger, I think, comes when we make him one or the other. And not both. I, I like what Matt Chandler wrote in, in the explicit gospel about how we try to figure God out. And how we figure, try to figure out just how big he is. He says this. Trying to figure out God is like trying to catch a fish in the Pacific Ocean with an inch of dental floss. Not going to happen. And then finding that balance between God's sovereign power and his love. I think Johnny Erickson Tata wrote about that in her book, The God I Love, A Lifetime of Walking with Jesus. And I think it's what we wrestle with sometimes when she said this, I wished God were like he used to be. A few notches lower. I wanted him to be lofty enough to help me, but not so uncontrollable. I longed for his warm presence, times when he seemed more safe. I think when we read stories like Job's, what we figure out is God doesn't fit into our safety standards. And the reason for that, Job knew it, Elihu knew it. God isn't defined by man. Man is defined by God. Let's, God let, let's let God be God. And, and not try to put him in a little box so that we feel comfortable with him. And so that he fits our understanding of what God should be. 
but we allow him to be God, who we're not going to always understand. One last thing that Elihu, I think, was on to in his conversation with Job, and this one has to do with the whole idea of repentance. I say it this way. When we have a fresh vision of God, it's going to lead to repentance. A fresh vision of God will always lead to repentance. Again, Elihu was operating under the same assumption as Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar that Job had committed some horrendous sin that was deserving of such punishment and suffering from God. He makes that point in chapter 34, verse 6, in one place. He says, for Job also said, he quotes Job here, he says, I am innocent, but God has taken away my rights. I'm innocent, but they call me a liar. My suffering is incurable, though I have not sinned. Then Elihu speaks, tell me, has there ever been a man like Job with his thirst for irreverent talk? Jump down to verse 36. Job, you deserve the maximum penalty for the wicked way you have talked. For you have added rebellion to your sin. You show no respect and you speak with angry words against God. This young man just doesn't beat around the bush, does he? He just says what's in his mind. He's angry. He doesn't have any problem attacking the friends. He doesn't have any tr problem attacking Job. And he's saying here, Job, quit fooling yourself. Just repent. And God will do the right thing. Problem was, both God and Job knew that he hadn't done anything to deserve what was happening to him. I do find it interesting, though, that in Job's final re reply to God that we're going to look at next week, he does repent of something. Do you remember that when you read the book? Job does repent. Look at that with me. Chapter 42. Turn all the way back. Chapter 42, verse 2. This is Job responding to God for the final time. And he says this. I know, God, that you can do anything, and no one can stop you. You ask, where is this, where is, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I, and I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. Sounds better. Let's go back. Job chapter 42, verse 2. God, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. And God asks, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? Job says, it's I. I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Job says, I'd only heard about you before, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. So, Job did repent, did he not? Just not for the reasons that Elihu wanted him to repent. He repented because during his suffering, he had said some things. He had thought some things about God that now he had to admit after seeing him were not true. It wasn't about anything that he had done to cause the suffering. Job repents because when he experienced these sufferings and he experienced God in a whole new light, he saw him in a way that he'd never seen him before. He noticed the blemishes. He noticed the sin in his own life. It's kind of like what happened with Isaiah, is it not? When in chapter 6 of his book, Isaiah encounters the living God, and the first thing that Isaiah says is, Woe to me, I am ruined. I'm a dead man. Because I've seen the living God. For Isaiah, a seraph immediately goes and puts coals in his mouth, and he cleanses him. For Job's part... He says, 
I repent. And this time he goes and sits in ashes and dust, not to mourn, but to repent. You know, the same thing happens in our lives. The more we focus on God, the more imperfections in our lives become clearer. We don't see them as sinful until we place them next to this perfect righteousness of God, and then they become pretty obvious. If we're living our lives detached from God, where he doesn't matter to us, and, and his word isn't a part of our lives, you know what? We set our own standards for righteousness. And what we'll do is we'll compare ourselves to someone else and say, at least I'm not as bad as that person. I don't gossip as much as they do. I don't drink as much as they do. I don't cheat on my spouse like they do. We're always comparing ourselves to someone that we know is struggling more with sin than we are in our own lives. We do that to justify ourselves. Because we know if we allow ourselves to compare our righteousness to the righteousness of God, spots are going to show up all over our lives. We have one advantage, though, that Job didn't have. We live on this side of the cross. He lived on that side. And you see, we probably believe, I hope we believe, that God indeed issues suffering and pain when we sin. The difference is, he doesn't put it on us. He put it on Jesus Christ. And Jesus took that to the cross. Because of his sovereignty, God chose not to punish us but to punish Jesus and give us grace. What we're going to see in a couple of weeks is that God indeed showed Job some grace when it was all said and done, but only after he had experienced him like he had never experienced him before. If you've known anybody who's gone through really tough suffering, and really hard times. You've probably heard the same thing. And that is that, you know what? I sought God. I experienced him at a whole new level as a result of that suffering. I think sometimes that's why God allows suffering to happen. It's because we begin to see him in a whole new light when we're crying out for him just to help us get through. Some who hear this message, I know, are going through suffering, going through some difficult times. And my prayer is simply that like Job, you will experience God like you've never experienced him before. And you'll experience his grace because you know that what's happening to you is not punishment for anything that you've done because he put that on Jesus. And that his sovereignty becomes what gets you through this hard time of life. Charles H. Spurgeon was a preacher in England in the 19th century, a great preacher. One of his most known quotes is this. When you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. Isn't that true? That when we're in the depths of struggle and pain and suffering, the only thing that we can really hold on to is the fact that our God is sovereign. He's already punished Jesus, and he's going to get us through that. I pray that you can rest your heads this week on the promise 
that God is powerful, that he is loving, and that he is gracious. Let's continue to sing his praise as we continue to worship.